All right, we are not live, but watching the recorded match of Corey Bowmaster versus Jesse Robkin. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do we know who's on the play or the draw here? It looks like Corey is on the play with very, very solid amulet hand. Turn three, one ring on the play. Lots of mana. Lots of good top decks here. Very nice to have a couple of Basajus to answer possible Leyline bindings. Yeah, a lot of value in the sand where it's like a five lander, but like obviously two Basajus, has the mana ramp going on as well, has the one ring, has the forest for the Castle Garen Brig, which is kind of cool too. So a lot about potential here, kind of this your typical ramp, like a lot of mana, I got to find something to do, but well set up. Yeah, exactly. And Jesse Mulligan to six and is down to four cards in hand, having to use the force of negation on the amulet of vigor. Yeah, counter spells are important here, obviously. And that's a, that's honestly like a pretty big play. You know, uh, Jesse down on cards, but like, you know, now it's basically just the one ring or bust for, for Corey. So can find another answer, has the binding for the, the ring itself. Uh, decent spot. Yeah, and then, uh, what we're seeing now is like exactly what happens when you remove the amulet of vigor from amulet type. You stop Corey from having a, <laughs> uh, you know, turn three ring into, you know, we're just playing a, a tap land here. We're playing, you know, Azusa next turn maybe accelerates this a little bit, but there's, the deck is just so much less scary without Amulet of Vigor in play. Yeah, pretty wide, you know, range of hands from Amulet where they can, I'm sure they can kill you on turn two, I think, right? With some with the perfect draw. Uh, but when things are get awkward, they look really awkward. You know, it's like <laughs> a draft deck with these bounce lands and these weird cards in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I always find those games of Modern to be really interesting when both players like interact with each other in really efficient ways. And then we're just left cobbling together some of like the most anemic <laughs> odd wins you've ever seen. Yeah, just the scraps just kind of just going at it. Now, that's kind of the the appeal though of Jesse's deck where like I was saying in the intro, Jesse's deck just kind of does the thing, right? There are just a bunch of thematic cards that make two eight eights, two four fours, I'm sorry, eight power total. And like when both players are scrapping, it's a pretty good place to be. It's a very fast clock. Yeah, absolutely. I think Jesse has an interesting decision here whether or not to use the Slayline binding on the Azusa um there's a few different things that like will factor into this decision one, one thing that i've definitely found playing against amulet titan with leyland binding decks is i do not want to use my binding on primeval titan um there it's just so easy for the titan player to have besage you or find besage you and then besage you the binding on the titan and just get the two extra triggers so yeah, it's interesting sorry it's interesting because no. because uh, binding is obviously one of the most powerful cards in the format but it does have these vulnerabilities where there are there are holes in it, which is cool and ways to kind of you know mitigate it. So that is uh, is nice to say. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it is an open deck list uh, event too, so we know that Jesse knows that Corey has um, the One Ring in the deck. Four full four copies of the One Ring. You know, could be it, it, Azusa is also a very scary card, and to some extent, you know here that you are going to use your mana next turn almost definitely to cast a Violent Outburst. Uh, it seems very tempting to want to just binding the Azusa and hope that the top two cards of your library are like castable spells. Kind of a safety valve too, where like Azusa can power up, you know, really powerful things that an amulet that can do. It's not like the most exciting here, honestly, until the ring gets going. But obviously, Jesse can't know that because we can see the hand and, uh, and she can't. Uh, but, you know, it makes a lot of sense, like you're saying, where with the outburst ready to go here, let's we'll just like slow things down, get these four fours down and try and get this game over with. Absolutely. I have a hard time imagining that Jesse's going to do anything besides play a land and pass. And then, you know, we are kind of in the top deck Titan portion of the game for Corey. It's, you know, a place that many Titan players thrive. <laughs> um, you know, the, the one ring will, you know, certainly draw Corey a lot of cards if uh, Jesse isn't able to find a, another copy of Binding, but... Important to note that Jesse does have three copies of Bone Crusher Giant in the deck as well, like an open deck list. And Bone Crusher can kind of like stop that final fog as far as getting the damage through. But now, second ring for Corey means that the ring will probably be gone for a while here, still at 20 life. Uh, second ring's pretty huge. It's going to be a lot of cards coming, and there's not really much going on for Jesse besides these two, these two four fours. Yeah, if she can't find a force of negation, Bone Crusher, Leyland Binding, we're going to see ring in its truest form. Four mana, time lock, draw three cards. The second copy is not it. Then we got to find it. It's already there too. Mm -hmm. You know, very notably too, Jesse is opting to play the four color version of Rhinos five if you five color if you count uh, Dismember, opting for Leyland Binding over Blood Moon. And you know, typically Blood Moon is a card that you'd 
won a lot against Amo Titan. Big year too, but these Besejus have kind of course freebie Azusa, you know, and mm -hmm. with the, the card flow coming from these rings over the next few turns, there's gonna be a lot of extra lands to play. So Azusa is also very, very powerful. Dude, five is a force though. Wow. All right. Yeah, that's that's a really big deal. You know, being able to if Corey's only play is the one ring, then Corey's life total is just gonna get chomped up by these rhinos really quickly. So no damage just yet. The one ring one ring bubble is still there, so Rhino's got to stay home and chill, but still obviously a very fast clock and the force is huge. Yeah, maybe fearing a primeval titan, Jesse might be choosing to ice one of the, the lands here. Yeah, looks like it. Now, Corey could potentially besage you the binding with this bounce land mana, which would give him enough mana to cast a titan if he draws it off uh, one of the rings. It yeah, does close to mana response. I mean, and we are seeing the weakness of binding here, of course. You know, isn't that being a sort of temporary solution? And then, uh, you know, once Corey gets to do the things that he wants to do, uh, they're so big, the game will essentially end. Yeah, you know, a power is a power, but it doesn't, you know, really compete with the power of Dryad, Valakit, Primeval Titan. Corey, it does seem to be debating the merits of using the Besage on the binding here, taking, taking his time. has um, almost complete information about what he can do with this turn since he, he doesn't quite know what he's drawing on his draw step and decides not to use the Besage on the Binding this turn and draws a Simic Growth Chamber. Interesting, with the with the two with the extra Besage in hand, and now always lands as well, um, kind of an interesting choice, you know, valuing to hold on to Besage. Um, yeah, I'm surprised, I honestly. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine I, it'd be hard to like really feel like you're scared of another copy of Leyline Binding too, because like you said, you have the second copy of the Sage. I, I do wonder what was going through Corey's mind, but we're you know un, unlucky to not have Corey in the booth with us today. I can call him. <laughs> <laughs> One of the benefits of having uh, you know the pre-recorded match. Say, hey, Corey, on turn, on turn three. What are you thinking, man? You know what was going on there? But <laughs> yeah, we can really <laughs> berate both of them on their on their plays. <laughs> that would have been kind of a fun format to have. I, I mean, I guess it's pre-recorded because they couldn't be here, but <laughs> if, if for them to commentate over their lines would be an interesting format. You do it like real world style, where it's like you know you cut to them. It's like, well, yeah, that was a spot, you know, where. Uh... <laughs> Okay, we have a very crucial blue card drawn for Jesse here, so she would be able to slam with the rhinos, violent outburst to pump them, and potentially hold up a force negation for Summoner's Pact or the One Ring. She's got to be scared of the old Primeval Titan, though. But you know, as of right now, there's no copies of the card in Corey's hand. Yeah, with no answer to the Titan anyway. Um, just having the ability to force a bunch of damage through and have you know that one key counter spell is going to be huge. Yeah, Corey, I'm trying to count up how much mana Corey can have next turn. I think if you count Castle Bar Garenbrig as a double land, he can have like 11 mana here um, with the extra land drop from Dryad, assuming no Amulet of Vigor is drawn. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave that math to you. Um, Amulet's one of those decks that I... I just there's some decks in Magic where I just look at them and it just my, my brain just turns off. So I mean, Amulet's always confused me. I played it once or twice, but not really a great success so uh i'll leave that to you yeah it's it's definitely it's one of these <laughs> difficult pieces of machinery to operate i think but uh definitely an effective tool in the right hands i i usually like to play my amulet decks without primeval titan but you know that's you know <laughs> not necessarily recommended <laughs> oh my oh, god well, the, the three cards drawn amulet of vigor primeval titan primeval titan I may really, not know much, but that's good. <laughs> I, I think that the Amulet of Vigor, well, I guess there's not a Bounce Land in hand, but it does give one extra mana off the Crumbling Vestige. Yeah, if, if there was a Bounce Land, the Amulet would have given Corey enough mana to definitely play both Titans uh, this turn. But with Jesse not having Subtlety, has Force of Negation instead, um, it's very likely that just this Amulet, or just the first Titan, will be good enough. The question is, though, that there is Force for Amulet. So I guess now maybe uh, if, if the force ha the force kind of has to happen here. Yeah, I think now, off. now the ring can just come down and just kind of buy that extra turn, buy some more mana and play too. Um, you know, there's still a lot of four force in play for Jesse. So 
this kind of yeah. opens up the, you know the full range of options to Corey. Jesse now empty handed, and Corey's kind of just ready to rock and roll. Yeah, although I think that just playing Primeval Titan, getting two Valakits and playing two lands is lethal. That should be at least eighteen damage. And with Jesse have no no cards in hand, we could just go for that. Looks good to me. There you go. I think, yeah, I guess it's actually twenty two damage because you with the uh, extra land drop. I I, I would ever I always think that two Valakits entering the same is two Valakit triggers, not four. Uh, this is not the first time I've I've done that math wrong. But this is going to be good enough, and Corey is going to be victorious game one, which I think is to be expected with this matchup. You know, Jesse came, you know, not with any main deck Blood Moons. Does have, you know, four main deck subtleties, but overall, I think that, you know, Amulet Titan is a deck that kind of, like, preys on winning game one and hoping not to, like, get too affected by sideboard cards post-board. Yeah, that, that game was, was definitely a, a one-ring game for sure, where it was kind of scrappy. You know, and you you think the player with the four fours would be in, in good shape there, but time walk, draw a bunch of cards, and then unsurprisingly drew the cards needed, and then was good <laughs> enough. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, Jesse has a lot of big mana hate in her sideboard. She has two Besaju, two Obsidian Charball, but these cards are a little bit more effective against Tron than against Amulet Titan. We have seen a lot of Tron in the Super League in previous weeks, um, which is maybe part of the reason why we see some players pivoting over to Amulet of Vigor instead to kind of dodge these effects a little bit more effectively. Um, Besage you, Force of Vigor. Force of Vigor is very good against, you know, Amulet Titan, Charmall. They, they're they're certainly okay, but you know, individually they'll need to be they'll they'll need to be backed up by pressure. These are not like Blood Moon type effects that just kind of win the game on their own. Interesting to see here. Yeah, obviously the Force of Vigor is very good against the Ursa Saga Amulet draws. We see the sagas coming out of the Amulet deck on Corey's side. Is that like is that a common thing? Um, I I've heard that that's something that Amulet Titan players do. Um. It's. I think with seeing that Jesse only has two Force of Vigors, I might be tempted to not bring out the full, uh, the full four amulet or the full four Urza sagas. Um, but I, I I know that I I also like look at amulet titan cyborgs like this, and I, I just get very confused. Like we have two generous we have a colony garden, we have explorers in the cyborg. This is usually a card that you see in the main deck. We have Stormkill Vanguard, which is mostly like a weird disenchant, or a cool disenchant, but a <laughs> weird one. And I, you know, it's this is this is definitely you know the complicated machinery aspect. Like I think that these are all like very specific, purpose-driven sideboard cards that you know, as someone who doesn't play a lot of Amulet Titan, um, I I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> it, it it looks like they're they're for Blood Moon mostly, you know, and then the, the mm -hmm. sagas coming out makes sense. It's almost like Corey's boarding for Blood Moon, but of course, open deckless we know just doesn't have Blood Moon. You know, take the sagas out, bring some more basic land stuff. That kind of makes a lot of sense. Uh, but interesting to see, of course, that we know just doesn't have Blood Moon. Corey knows that as well. Uh, but coming in anyway, so the package is sort of sort of there are going to come in, and uh, we're going to see how it works out. Yeah, and maybe to some extent, like you just like if you know you don't want Urza Saga in this matchup, then you just kind of have to bring in like the Jinnersons and stuff to kind of compensate for those that lack of lands. That's fair. Um, I how do how do you feel about Jesse's hand, Jim? I mean, it's got. I mean, with self the end force and then a threat. Also, I was lacking a third land's kind of rough. The footballs itself is also like almost just a mulligan. I don't think it'll matter that much, but. It's pretty hard to mulligan salty force with a threat also. I agree, yeah. And I think, you know, I agree that the footfalls is not likely going to matter much. Like, there's even maybe an argument for holding it as a green card for force of vigor. But there's also a good chance that if you can, like, force and subtlety something, that the, the suspended rhinos will be impactful with this game. Yeah, I, I can see that happening for sure. On the play here, a couple interactive cards. Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, with more interaction post-board as well. And then, um, you know, Corey's... Of course, slowing down a little bit. Generous Sense is a little bit slower than Urza Saga is when it comes to you know finding amulets and doing the, the linear stuff. So yeah, it seems like he has another hand that's kind of fragile to the amulet of vigor getting force of negation. I'm interested to see what else he can put together here. You know, no, no one ring to kind of save him this time. So yeah, I, I think in a, in a big way, this game may come down to like, does Jesse find land number three um, on turn before by turn three? Although I guess I, I counter to that would be that if the cards drawn are any combination of ice, force, negation, uh, subtlety, and 
sort of able to play. I mean, we, we, the Rhinos is suspended on turn one. You know, if it could just be a lot of interaction. If it's not land, it has to be spells. If it's spells or interaction, that could be good enough. Yeah, that, that is absolutely true. Fire Ice is like such a potent play in these decks, especially on turn two. Let's see, that top card I'm staring at, it's a Leyline Binding. Probably a little bit frustrating for Jesse to have to have used the Force of Negation there and then see that there's Leyline Binding on top of the library. Like, I think she may have preferred to like binding the amulet and save the Force of Negation for a One Ring. Yeah, it's tough now because now the one Rhino's Cascade card's obviously blue. It kind of got a hold of her subtlety. So the, the Suspend Rhino's might end up uh, end up being really important. And there you called it. There's the Fire Ice, which is, you know, if you know if Jesse wasn't going to draw a land here, that, that may have been the next best thing. A little, little time walk action. Of course, uh, you know, Gora's Rush really had much to do here with the mana anyway. Uh, but of course, Jesse can't know that, so... Yeah, and Jesse draw is just about the worst one off the crashing footfalls. I yeah. I would I would expect her to probably hold that for a top decked force of vigor. I think it's kind of unrealistic to expect that the turn four suspended crashing footfalls <laughs> ever really becomes relevant against Amulet Titan. Yeah, I mean, scrappy games are good. That's a, that's a little too scrappy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, Lauren Neville is a nice you know mana fixer, nice blue pitch card, but does have the very real downside of being your third land that you top deck on turn four, and yet you have to play yet again another tap land. That being said, Jesse does get to hold up Subtlety Ley Lane Binding, does have the first Crashing Footfalls coming down next turn, will have another copy of Crashing Footfalls coming down the following turn, and Corey has also not done a lot this game. Has just three mana in play, has basically just played a land every turn after getting the Amulet Force, and you know no real sign of having a strong follow-up anytime soon. Yeah, another land there too. That's this is kind of like the classic, you know, ramp thing. You know, realistically, you know, Amulet Titan is a very weird combo deck, but it is essentially just a ramp deck because it's just a ton of mana, a couple important payoffs, you know. And then when things go wrong, it usually go wrong to the element of I've just drawn, you know, my deck's half lands. I've drawn a lot of lands. Yeah, absolutely. And and a lot of the lands are like can be a little bit awkward too. You have this like you, you, you there's a lot of hands you have to mulligan because all your hands are bounce lands and. <laughs> And you can't actually get anything in play. And, and then also vice versa. You need that first bounce land so badly. I think Corey seems to be debating the merits of uh, using Summer's Pack to get an Azusa. Just to start to get the mana developed. Which plays pretty poorly into the Leyline Binding over there. That maybe isn't the hardest to sniff out with the untapped Temple Garden. And Jesse not doing that much else. Yeah, definitely a risk of course. Uh, gets to play the extra land. The one extra land and that's it. Because um, the bounce sets will trigger. Uh, there isn't really a way to mitigate that either. So of course, if if if, if Corey was able to to avoid a trigger of some kind, uh, Corey could just lay land, land, land in a row. But all the lands have some sort of trigger except for the Viseju. So you could I use the Vesuva to copy one of Jesse's lands. Um, I don't think that that I, I believe Vesuva has no trigger as it enters the battlefield if you don't copy a bounce land. That could be a way to get one extra land into play before sure. the binding. So between between that and the uh, and the Besaju, if the Besaju wants to come down as a as a land and not a spell, which is also a hard thing to do with, mm -hmm. you know, but I guess it's bounce lands too. So yeah, you'll be you'll be able to bounce that Besaju back to the hand, and you know it's not going to get stranded underneath the Blood Moon because of the open deck lists. All right, going for it. So, uh, those those lingering rhinos, we can't see them right now, but they are in the exile zone. And they are coming next turn, so uh, you know there is pressure coming. And again, it's just a three turn clock. It's just, you know it's a lot of a lot of power and toughness. This is yeah. so stressful too for for Corey. I gotta imagine where like as someone who's you know played a combo deck that I wasn't necessarily super comfortable with in big a big tournament before. It's hectic, you know, because you're kind of like you're trying to figure it out of a spot. We're used to seeing these amulet players just like this is their their bread and butter. They're their home when they play a deck like this. When you're a player who's not super familiar with it, you're kind of like, all right, this is a tough spot. I'm playing in a tournament. I gotta figure this all out in the spot, and it can be difficult. Yeah, in, in some ways, it, it can feel like you're hyper-focused, and, <laughs> and it's, sometimes it can feel like you're operating on a different level, but more realistically, you're you're just not going to be able to to use it as effectively as someone like Dom Harvey, although I, yeah. don't know that, I don't know that anybody uses Amulet as effectively as Dom Harvey. Very true. Unbelievable run by Dom in the, in the, the modern PT. Absolutely. I beat him in round... I think five to put him to like to three losses. And I was like, yeah, sorry, bud, you know, and then <laughs> <laughs> next day, uh, one of us is in and one of us isn't. So, <laughs> and he took that personally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Jesse thinking, I wonder, yeah, subtle seeing the Suzusa is pretty juicy. Like, you get to, like, just time walk uh, Corey due to the Summer's Pack trigger. Doing so would, of course, cost you your Ardent Plea, but you don't have another blue card anyways. Yeah, got to go for it. Yeah, the, 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 the tempo here is huge. You know, mm -hmm. got to pay your Pact, you know, and that's just two more turns. The Rhinos are coming in. A bit all in, you know, there isn't really much else going on here, uh, but. Drawing as soon as the next turn doesn't matter too much, obviously, if uh, all your lands are trapped. Mm -hmm. And Jesse has a few land destruction spells in her deck between Besaidu and Obsidian Sharmal, but I, I guess only Besaidu is going to be this top deck that just can Besaidu the Growth Chamber and make Cory die to Summoner's Pact. There are three, and I kind of want to see it. I'm not going to lie. I love Corey. We're good friends, but uh, a little uh, a little stone rain for the win in front of in a, into a pact. Mm. Not today, but yeah, wrong land. This is maybe the, I guess, just the second card this game that if Jesse knew this was the top card of her library, she almost definitely would have played differently. I think that Jesse knew her top card was a blue card. She would have binding the Azusa, then play Art and Plea, then hold up the subtlety for the following turn. How do you feel about cycling this uh, this Lorian rather than you know holding it for a blue card? Is that is that fourth or fifth land going to matter that much? Um, so the fourth land lets you hard cast a subtlety, so and you can also hard cast the four. So I don't think holding it to pitch ends up mattering that much, um, because you're just going to be able to, with with so few cards in hand, you're going to be able to hard cast any of the the pitch cards. I'm just going to scroll through Jesse's list. Oh yeah, you also can cast Obsidian Charmal if Corey plays a colorless land, which could end up being relevant. And there's the subtlety that is hard castable right. and and almost there just like almost just unbeatable here. It's it's only eleven next turn. Yeah, uh, I... but still very powerful. You know, the, the, the one one ring draw is also pretty good too. So. Options here for sure, although kind of the problem where Corey has mostly got to just decide on on one thing. We could see Azusa into the one ring, barring any interaction. Uh, but well, also, Jess, Jesse has used a number of interactive spells already too. You know, Corey could also just feel like, hey, maybe the coach is just clear here. I think I think one problem for Corey can Corey even go Azusa into the ring? So you have the crumbling vestige, which can make a mana. Um, but it has a trigger associated with it. So like, can, can, can Corey do it if there's a removal spell on Azusa? Is maybe something he's thinking about. I think, if, I think if he goes flow to mana off Besaidu, play a bounce land, pick up the Besaidu, play Azusa, play Besaidu, then put the Crumbling Vestige trigger on the stack, that'll leave him with four mana afterwards without a window for the Azusa to be removed. That would be a very heads up play. And of course, we're, ma we're, we're making all of these, you know, these these conclusions based on seeing all the all the cards already available too. So Corey needs to needs to find the find the line and also be aware of you know of the things he's playing around and so on and so forth. You know, being a binding here, or salty. So this is going to be kind of fun to watch. Yeah, it, it it can always be very tempting to just slam the Titan. You have six mana, your Titan deck, just slam it. But you know, one thing too is if if it does get subtletyed, you're you're in you're in pretty tough shape where like casting Titan the following turn will not win you the game. Like the Titan is kind of just like a setup card this turn in a big way slash, you know, blocker for a Rhino. Big spot. Tough deck too. Really? Is yeah. Very so many moving parts in the stack. Like watching someone who's a master play of a stack is really like, Oh wow. I didn't, I didn't see any of that. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, yeah. they, they, they usually come to it so naturally, too. Like, oh, yeah, you just do this, 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 and that. You're like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I love watching Titan players, like, figure out um, moments to play around things and, like, ways to play around things in unique ways. And here, That's Corey cool. decides to copy the Crumbling Vestige. This is, this is another way to play around a removal spell to get up to four mana that I didn't see. All right, there it goes. In the tank, finds the line. Finds the line. It would be a pretty heads up play for Corey to tap the ring on Jesse's upkeep. Um, just completely tax her mana, or like to either either Jesse is going to let Corey get a card off the ring, or he's going to tax her mana in a way that she can't binding and subtlety on her turn. Obviously, with mm -hmm. perfect information, something we're thinking about. Like it's it's always so difficult to pin your opponent on like 
two specific pieces of interaction like this. But that, that is what uh, Corey does. And Corey is not only able to draw a card off this Leyland Binding, but Corey will also be able to use the Besage to get the One Ring back uh, yeah. on a later turn. Which is huge because the not only getting the card draw back as well, but even just the fog right now, you know, with the Titan in hand, enough matter to play Titan and then fog for a turn is huge. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of of the opinion that binding is just pretty dang bad against these uh, Amulet Titan decks. And five uh, with no charm on site. Not looking <laughs> exciting. The, char the charm are cheaper with the vestiges anyway. So, yeah, that's true. Um, so Corey could potentially consider binding or besaging the binding first and you know just see one extra card and see if that changes any decision process here. But I might like to just cast the primeval titan and see what happens. I guess the only benefit would be I guess trying to draw the amulet itself. Yeah, that that's fair. So and you you do have a second besage you in hand to play around a binding on your other on your titan. So yeah, I guess, I guess there's not a huge downside to doing this first. Oof. Yeah, that's so, exciting lad. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't doesn't help a ton. And so it looks like it's titan time and Celty of course will, you know, put this down for a turn, but you know, shields are up. Yeah, so the, the Zeusa notably will also have to chump block because the one damage from the ring and com combined with the 11 damage from the creatures adds up to 12. Um, Corey is also just dead if Jesse draws any removal spell. Um, and it's hard to imagine that a another subtlety at the top would be possibly beatable. I mean, even, even again, just casting this Titan next turn isn't going to accomplish that much without a Dryad or Amulet in play. Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll accomplish more than I think with with Corey being able to develop his mana in a pretty meaningful way with the Azusa here. Let's see, he's gonna have eight, nine, what, eleven mana next turn? Eight, ten, more than that. Yeah, I guess yeah, more than that with the uh, extra land jumps. No, the, the Azusa will die, so. You know, assuming Besage gets plays an untapped land up to 12 mana. Let's see if Corey just draws something easy. And that Ooh. is that is exactly a super clean way to end this game. All right. So a few awkward draws early gets paid off in a big draw late for Jesse. Absolutely. So you know, you know, good for her to like double check the math, make sure everything is above board here. Um I think we're gonna be going to game three very shortly. Seven and one, you know, a ring is powerful, but uh, you know, temptation <laughs> does cost you. Yeah, one life is one life. What can I say? That bump rusher there for good measure too. Uh, so some scrappy games here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Neither of these games have been, you know, the deck either deck really doing its thing. It's honestly very fun to watch, like you were saying. You know, seeing these these scrappy kind of crazy games is awesome. So, you draw those cards on the way out, and then uh, you know if we're gonna die with power, we'll die with a lot of power. Yeah, I, I I do wonder if Corey might consider bringing the Urza Sagas back in on the play because it's kind of hard to get like them sniped by Obsidian Charmal if you just play at turn one. Um, yeah. I also think that they just play well against the interaction too, right? Mm -hmm. You know, with the counter spells and stuff. You know, if mana's being left up, you can kind of just chill and do your Saga thing. Um, I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure. And very simply put, the card is pretty dang good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. It really, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of all right. So, yeah. and there are, there aren't really that many, you know, two Force of Vigor, two Charmaws. You know, there's no backbreaking elements to the card. Oof, mm -hmm. this is a hand. Yeah, Corey's hand is nice. so juicy. Just yeah, no any problem. any bounce land is going, or I guess not any bounce land. It's really going to have to be Simic Growth Chamber would just make that hand so powerful. But I think a very disciplined mulligan from Corey, not really having um, the bounce line to have that double amulet hand do anything. Uh, Jesse's hand is looking great. You know, we have Besaju, we have a turn three Charles agent, which is huge. We also have subtlety, one of the best cards of the matchup. Crashing footfalls does seem to be kind of permanently summoned to the hand. Or is this, 
she already put a card back. I think it's a six card hand. I, I missed what the seventh card she put back was. Maybe just another copy of Crashing Footfalls. Back instead. Ori's six card hand looks great. You know, this is this is also something too that when it comes to combo decks and mulliganing, if you're not super experienced, and not, I'm not saying that's what's happening with Corey, but like you can look at that first hand, know that it has a lot of the pieces that you have, and not like exactly understand what your range of mulligans needs to look like. But I think this is a really good example of just like how powerful a six card hand with Amo Titan can look like, and how you can feel pretty comfortable mulliganing aggressively in a deck with so many bounce lands that can just recoup those cards for you pretty well. We've had some scrappy games. I would love to see a generous end to get cast. Sorry, <laughs> that's my wish list for this uh, for this game here. It blocks rhinos pretty well. That's huge. All right, and the Amulet of Vigor not getting Force of Negation for the first time this match. Yeah, we see a, we see a blue card drawn here also. So. Mm -hmm. Very weird decision point between using the Besaidu to suspend crashing footfalls or trying to use the Besaidu to Besaidu the amulet on turn two. It's not a decision point I envy very much. Um. Oh, wait, there's another wait, card over there. We got whoa. the hidden card. Oh, okay. Whoa, all right. <laughs> this changes. Whoa, that changes everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it actually does change everything because now we know that Jesse does like does have the third land. <laughs> so like what needs to besage you a little bit less. Um, that being said, doesn't have a turn one green source, which is pretty crucial, which means that Jesse cannot save the besage you and suspend crashing footfalls turn one. All options here for sure. And it, like, like we mentioned too, there is some value in holding Crushing Footfalls because you can pitch it to a, a Force of Vigor that you draw later. Big trust step here. And she does decide to you know, save the Besaidu for the Amulet, which may just end up ramping Cory right into this one ring. Or the Generoset. <laughs> and or the Generoset. <laughs> Your Cory just slam Dryad here. I mean, it seems pretty good, right? You get to play yeah. the true, true extra land for it as well. I just doesn't matter, but um, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, we, so far we've seen Amulet uh, without Amulet in play, and now we're going to see it. You know, at least for a little while here with Amulet in play, which is obviously a huge, huge difference. Yeah, and Cory does decide to bounce the Besaidu instead of the Castle Garenbrig. Um, or sorry, sorry, it bounces the Besage instead of the Celestial Sanctuary. So, you know, sometimes you'll see Amulet Titan players really prioritize holding that bounce land so they can generate a lot of mana. Corey does know just he's just playing a pile of interaction and just developing the mana, uh, especially with the one ring in the hand, does seem like a pretty good plan here. Yeah, this is this plays, plays very well against Besage, so or a possible uh, finding, I guess. Mm -hmm. What is Lorien going to reveal? I imagine a green source, so yeah. it would have to be breeding pool. There it is. <laughs> I like how we thought this was a two lander. It's actually not, it's just a five lander. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, it doesn't have to be Besaju here. Like, you know, there's. Not a lot going on otherwise. You know, of course, the, the Rhino deck, you know, is powerful, but, you know, often locked to threatening on turn three. Mm -hmm. I'm not going on earlier turns, so. I think you're pretty priced into using the Besaidu here. Um, it's a very weird spot, too. Like, you could maybe even make a good argument that it's better to Besaidu the Dryad than the Amulet. Yeah. Um, it, it, one, one unfortunate thing is, like, if Cory just has an untapped land in the Titan, if you besage you the amulet, you're going to give Cory the, the forest. Any land with that Castle Garenbrig, uh, untapped land with the Castle Garenbrig, is going to allow Cory to just cast the Titan. If you yeah. besage you the Dryad, um, it's also it's also the same the same equation here. So, you you know you do have the subtlety to buy a single turn against Titan. Maybe you're lucky and it's a Summoner's Pact and you get two turns, but it's 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 it seems 
it seems very difficult. In fact, you could even make a, a case for not use the Beseju here uh, or immediately. If Corey plays a bounce land, this is maybe a signal that he's going to try to play a primeval Titan this turn, and you can Beseju the bounce land to try to keep Corey off of uh, Titan mana. That's cute. Yeah. yeah. And then if, it, and if nothing gets cast, you can Beseju you something else end of turn. Yeah, this is mostly tough for Jesse because, like, there's just no pressure right now either, you know? Like, so this is the kind of game where, you know, next turn pressure can come, but then still has to wait a turn to attack also, you know? And there only is so much interaction in this Rhino's deck, you know? <laughs> like, we've got, we got a solid, we got a solid, we got a Besage you, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, once the mana starts to get in play for Corey, a lot of the top of the deck becomes really, really alive. So we are channeling the Besaju now, and we're ch we're targeting the one the one thing we didn't talk about. Jesse lands <laughs> on the Celestia Sanctuary, but it it does just make a lot of sense. This is going to make it a lot tougher for Corey to just to have Titan mana next turn. Yeah, that is true. It's now only three mana to work with. Uh, this Ent the Ent Dream is dead, I think, unfortunately. Yeah, I think uh, I think it has to be cycled <laughs> here. The One Ring Dream is still alive though, so still you know the backup plan here is just you know play land land play One Ring, which is still obviously very good. Yeah, I I am I love that like you know we sit here and talk about the line for ten minutes or whatever, and Jesse, <laughs> and Jesse finds the better line that yep. like I didn't see, and you know, you know it's just very very cool. You know, the Modern Super League is comprised of some of the best players in the game, and it's just a joy to watch them. That oh, is great. The int dream is oh, live oh, again. Okay, okay, I'm 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 back. You can't see me, but I'm back up in my chair now. All right, I was slumping <laughs> a little bit, but now I think I'm ready to roll. And I guess one more point for Jinderson. It is a six mana creature, so it is you know discounted by Castle Garenbrig too. <laughs> that wasn't like the main point. Like why is it that <laughs> right? Like I don't know. I, it's hard to get in the mind of an Amon Titan player. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing. It's turn three. Here's Rhinos. That works. So the clock is there. But honestly, it the. The generous end does actually block really well. It's kind of the issue with the Rhino deck where like mm. the four fours are good and they are cheap, but like you put, you know, a five, five in play or something like that. And things get a little bit challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And this Valakid is also going to be online. The Explorer it, helps. Yeah. And with the Explorer, we'll be able to trigger twice, killing a Rhino or just dealing six to Jesse's face. Yes. Yeah, this, this game is, uh, Starting to tilt's definitely in Corey's favor mm. for sure. It's kind of cool seeing is like, you know, this isn't really like a, a combo kill. This is sort of just like, you know, amulet mid-range here. It's like, you know, make some extra land drops, kill a few things, get a little value. I I really do. I really hope in Corey doesn't draw Explore or doesn't draw Titan off the Explorer so that you can see the hardcast Jinner sent here. I mean, with the, with the Valakid available also, <laughs> it might just be uh, it might just be too late. Yeah, I think so. Or he still, despite you know being in a pretty good position, takes his time. Very methodical. Smart, honestly. It's a kind of very common thing people kind of comment on, you know, when they're watching a high level match. Like, we'll just kill him. We'll just kill him. We win already, you know. And it's like, <laughs> no, nah, like there's been plenty of times where you've watched a player just like completely throw away a one game, and this one of the worst things you could possibly do is to fight hard an entire game and throw it away at the end. So, yeah, absolutely. Take the time here. Also, as a player, you know, who's been in, you know, in big matches and big spots, like when you're about to win, you kind of feel a bit of like, all right, let me just make sure I get this right. You know, like, is the, the you recognize how damaging it would be uh, to throw it away at the end there, too. So take a second, look it through. Another ring for uh, a little extra, extra oomph. Well, yeah, which is the more powerful Lord of the Rings card, Generous End or the One Ring? Close. Yeah, very close. Yeah. So Valka's gonna start firing off, and uh, yeah, nineteen life for Corey here. You know, again, the there's a uh, there's a cap on the Rhino stack. You know, it does its thing; it does a pretty it does it pretty well. But like, there's no real you know ceiling beyond just making some four fours and attacking. There isn't really a, a good way to kind of come back from a board like this. Yeah, and you know it's, it's also pretty unfortunate. I guess I guess you will get to subtlety the generous end, but you know this is you know it, to some extent like what it's like to play a deck with lots of interaction in modern. You know your interaction has to line up well against what it is your opponent is doing proactively. Otherwise, it is just it is just so hard to win. You know Jesse had subtlety and Besaju instead of a force of negation or a force of vigor. 
Yeah. Um, and I, I think we would have seen a pretty different game if those had been the pieces of interaction instead. Shows the power. Shows the power of the amulet deck too. Honestly, the fact that you know just kind of just play some extra lands and play a ring or two. You know, the ring's a huge element in this deck because the, it gives the deck the ability to kind of a just buy that extra turn to to go off, and then b in these grindy matchups just. Do the one ring, yeah. You know, like the one ring is pretty good. You just draw a lot of cards, and and like you know, when you have enough cards, you can put it all together. Usually, yeah, it can be really tough to like attack a deck like this that from you know so many different angles where it's playing efficient creatures, its lands are tough to interact with, and you have to have to worry about this like super good card advantage engine. The the one ring too just plays so well with all the extra land effects. Realistically, mm-hmm. like where you know you're kind of just playing it straight up, where I'm just gonna play extra lands and draw cards. You know, like no tricks. Just you know, I'm just gonna play some more stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna keep you know, we're gonna hit turn five. I'm gonna have you know eight or nine mana in play, and I have four cards in my hand, which is usually a good place to be. Yeah, Amulet Titan, the most honest deck in modern. Yeah, definitely. Very very <laughs> fair. So we we've we've floated a colorless man off the Slayer Stronghold. So maybe that's what's getting bounced. That is what's getting bounced. And here we go. No way. No way. Oh, we're doing it. All right. I know I like Corey for a reason. Not only is Corey casting this generous end, he's floating a white mana. So with this extra land drop, he can give it hasted vigilance to get in for seven. All right. Style points are uh they're kind of they're, they're adding up here. I at least, at least I think Corey has an extra land drop. He's never he's he's definitely acting like he does with the floating white mana. I've kind of I've kind of lost track between the Explorer, the Dryad, and the the Land for Turn, but I'm hoping. Although this is kind of like a flavor fail, right? We have like yeah. this really fast Ent, you know, like. Yeah, I think he's just sacking the food token, actually. Oh, man. All right, all right. that's fine. I miscounted. Yeah, and like we were saying, you know, it's funny because it seems silly to have this draft common in play, but like a 5-7 is actually a huge deal against Rhinos. You know, it really, you know, the Rhino player is kind of like, it's sort of like empty the warrants, right? Where you just have like, I have X tokens, your your let total is X, is Y. You know, how many times can I attack on my tokens to kill you? And having that big blocker really like mucks the math up a lot. You know, where mm-hmm. now every time you attack, you lose a four four. Are you getting through enough damage? And once you throw the ring in there and the you know twenty two life's a lot anyway, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. Yeah, absolutely. It's gonna be hard to imagine that Jesse can cobble together. Um a win from this point you know with just three more cards coming from the ring another ring in hand valakid online there's a primeval titan it's just going to be so tough yeah from this point i think even like we with this azusa drawn we just have like a pretty clear easy kill with with i have four land drops this turn and i have a valakid in play you're at 12 life that's 12 damage yeah of course you know this is the modern super league gotta take some time think about all the angles but i Think that we're going to see Corey be our first semifinalist in the modern Super League here with Amulet. Too. I really, I really got to ask Corey if he's played Amulet before because I really, you know, I'm I bet he has. Corey. I, has he played it like in, like, you know, like in a, in a big event before? I bet he has. I, I knew Corey's played a lot with like the, um, the grinding station breach deck, you know, also, you know, combo aficionado. I, I bet Corey's played more Amulet Titan than we realize. He hasn't played Breach for so long that like it's hard to imagine him playing literally anything else. So, <laughs> well, didn't he bring? Uh, I think he brought Scam last time to Super League too. That's true. Could be misremembering. Although I feel like almost everybody's brought Scam at this point. <laughs> I haven't. So I'll <laughs> I'll take that one and put that a little notch in my uh in my resume or whatever. Yeah, you should get double the prizes if you win Super League, <laughs> not playing Scam the whole time. No Scam for me. So. uh casting stuff here i mean obviously you know with the with the ring also i mean you know azusa they get salty the ring comes down and a reset get a fog either way yeah I, you know i i think that jesse will probably see that this azusa needs to be needs to be subtlety chill subtlety and then or you'll be left with six mana and a creature of you know you know a, a, a titan off the summer's pact wins another azusa wins um Seems hard to find a losing line here. Cast Summoner's Pact, pick creature at random in the deck. <laughs> yeah, misclick and grab Grazer would be... Yeah, I mean... No, Grazer is awesome. Yeah, Grazer's that's still pretty awesome. good, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be pretty disheartening to have to subtle to Azusa at this point, just leaving Corey with you know three mana floating, yeah. six cards in hand. <laughs> 
what are you going to do? Decides to pitch Shirtless Agent instead of Fire Ice. I think that's a good heads up play. I agree. Yeah, I think maybe maybe this ice can like if it's going to be a win stolen somehow, and tapping the end down, maybe just like I don't know, finding it finding it somehow is reasonable. It's an important thing too, you know. Obviously, like you know, you can watch this game and be like, "Why are these players still even playing?" You know, like clearly this is you know basically over. Mm-hmm. But like you know, you're one of the be- the best skills as a magic player, and one of our players, Reed Duke, I think is really really good at this. It's just like, all right, if if something's going to happen to win this game, what's it need to be, and just play towards it. You know, maybe something gets weird and uh you know uh i don't know gets tapped down too far maybe an ice taps a blocker and you draw i don't even know you know it, it's pretty tough at this point but at least looking for it is a really good exercise every time it may not be there but when you look for it you will find it some of the time that's a huge thing to win you know five percent of these games yeah and, and the best way to like find how how to win these games is to play them you know yeah exactly yeah. You may, you may not be able to see it, but if you just keep playing, you may stumble into a way that you can win that you didn't see. You know, there's not a lot of cost in playing it out. Yeah, I imagine there's, you know, a, not a coincidence that, you know, Reed is known as a player who doesn't concede and just happens to be one of the best players at winning these kind of like <laughs> really long, you won that game kind of games, you know, so it makes a yeah. lot of sense. You know, it can't be easier mentally just to concede, but but there we go. So Corey takes it down. 